Hello, my name is Tani Smith, and I'm one of the members here at Desert Grace. I'm excited to share this Sunday's message with you. Well, good morning. Thanks for having me come again. I was here three weeks ago, and I had a chauffeur. His name was Ron. I've got a new chauffeur today. His name's Ken, and this is Ken's first time to be here at this church. His name is Ken, and I'm Ken. And uh, we have so much in common, it's almost scary. It's almost like somebody switched, you know, the delivery, but he's a little older than I am. So he's Ken number one, in case you want to know. He's Ken number one, I'm Ken number two. Uh, speaking of chauffeur, there's a story about uh, a guy who was a, a mathematician. Ken will probably appreciate this. I don't think I've told this story to him. But there was a guy that was a mathematician, and he was really, really good. And he would do symposiums all over the country. And he had a chauffeur with him. And the chauffeur would drive him everywhere he needed to go and, and set up all the props and all that stuff. Well, he, they were together doing this for about almost 10 years. And finally, the chauffeur came up with an idea. And he said, you know, I would love for you to switch places with me because I think we could pull this off. And, you know, the mathematician was the, the kind that, hey, yeah, I think you're right. We'll do this. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what. I'll be the chauffeur and then you be the mathematician. And so they went to St. Louis on, on this symposium deal and they... The guy that was the chauffeur actually in real life went up and did this whole display of the mathematical principles and everything else and just oohed and awed everybody. And all of a sudden at the very end, you know, people were clapping and one guy got up and he stated a real difficult problem. And the guy was quick thinking and he said, you know, that is so easy, I'm going to let my chauffeur take care of it. <laughs> so, so I'm going to let my chauffeur take care of the difficult things. Now, you're probably asking, what does this have to do with the message today? Probably nothing. <laughs> but I do, I do have a message from uh, Matthew chapter 13. Jesus loved to tell stories called parables. A parable is when you take a, a story and lay it beside another story to illustrate a truth. So a parable is, is to lay something side by side, to cast it side by side. And Jesus was telling this story about the parable of the sower. I brought um, a, an apple that has seen better days. I, I ate an apple recently and I thought, I'm going to, as I was, I was thinking about this message, and I thought, I'm going to use this as an illustration. Uh, I know my illustration the last time I came didn't work until after everybody <laughs> left. But I, I, managed to, I managed to pull some seeds out of the apple. You probably can't see it because it's so small. But this one seed actually has a root on it. I mean, it started to grow. Yeah. And so I thought, wow, the power of a seed, uh, to me it's incredible, the power of a seed that can produce a tree that produces this. So you go from a seed to a tree to one of these. I have a friend that, um, I do have friends. And this, <laughs> this one lady actually used to live on the west side of Phoenix. Now she lives in our area in Mesa. And she comes to our, our Monday night groups that we have. And <clears throat> she was telling me that one of her lemon trees in one year produced 1,135 lemons. I had, to, I had to ask her again because that didn't sound right. No, she said 1,000. 135 lemons off of one tree in one year. The power of a seed to multiply like that. But you know, as powerful as a seed is, it needs several things to, in order for it to do that. Uh, Jesus actually said that, that a seed is, you know, it has to, unless a corn of wheat, or whatever seed it is, unless it falls to the ground and dies, it doesn't do anything. But when it goes to the ground and dies, it brings forth a bunch of fruit. Well, let's take a look at the parable of the sower because uh, the soil is so important in order for the seed to do its work. So if you have Matthew 13 ready for you, it's actually, is it up there? No, I, just that, okay. Uh, I know many of you have different Bibles and some of you probably have it on your smartphones and all that. But let's read together the first nine verses of Matthew 13. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. 
Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no fruit, or no root, excuse me. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundredfold, sixty or thirty times what was so, sown. He who has ears, let him hear. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your precious word, and I pray that this morning um, your truth would shine forth in our lives, that we may be able to be better followers of you who belong to you and you belong to us. We pray that your Holy Spirit would enlighten your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we're talking about this parable, I, I thought about the fact that a lot of times people talk about the four different types of soil that were in this parable. And while that is true, in a sense, it's really the same soil, but it's different preparation. So we see that there are four different soils here, four different preparations of soil. And by learning what these are, and by looking at the things that help prepare, this, this is hopefully a, a, an informational message and hopefully it'll be practical for you at the same time. So let's take a look first of all at the different uh, preparations of the soil. Notice that it says that a farmer went out to sow his seed and as he was sowing his seed, and remember the seeds we got here, they have such a such potential in a seed that it could not only produce this but it could produce a large tree with a lot of wood that can be used for various things. So there's a lot of potential in a seed. But it still needs that soil and how important it is. So let's talk about the soil. First of all, the soil represents the human heart. Jesus said that. And we understand that that's, that's the human heart. What is our heart like? Well, Jesus talks about four different soils, four different preparations of the soil. The first one is the hard-packed soil. And if you've ever uh, gone on a road out in the country and you've seen how hard the, the ground is, and you, know, you just can't imagine a, a seed growing there for very long. And sure enough, when he's talking about the seed being thrown out there by the farmer, the birds come and pick it up right away. And it has no chance to root. So the, the, that represents a person that basically has a hard heart, a person who has no desires for spiritual things or no desires for the things of eternity. Which is kind of interesting because in the book of Ecclesiastes, the Koholeth or preacher said this, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in man's heart and yet man cannot fathom the beginning nor the ends of the ways of God. So every person, regardless of what they say they don't believe or what they say they believe, there is that quest for eternity. And yet we're finite and God is infinite, so we have a problem. But the good news is God reached us through his son, Jesus Christ, revealed himself to us. And so it is possible. It's possible to believe because he makes it possible. But there are some that have the very hard heart there, they're resistant to anything about God or eternity. So what has to happen? What's the solution? Well, just as the farmer must plow the, the, the ground and plow up the, the fallow ground, like it says in, in the, um, the prophets, so God must do that in our lives. He must do that in the lives of people that are hard-hearted. Uh, we all know people that are uh, probably that way. I, I know some people at work. I work at uh, Walmart in Mesa, Arizona, and I come across a lot of people, and there's a lot of people who are very, they just don't want to talk about spiritual things, or they don't believe at all. I've heard people tell me they're atheists, and 
Uh, one person that said they were atheists, I asked them, are you absolutely sure? I mean, uh, Albert Einstein said one time that uh, as he was talking to a group of, of skeptics and, and very intelligent people, he said, the, the, most, the smartest person in the world probably has 3% of the, of the world's knowledge. When you stop and think about it, that's probably inaccurate. In fact, it may be even less now because the more we know, the more we don't know. But afterwards, after he was given this talk, then uh, one guy came up to him and said, well, Mr. Einstein, I, I believe I'm very intelligent, but I, I'm an atheist. And he says, okay, I'll grant you that. I'll grant you that you're very intelligent. I'll, gr I'll grant that you have 3% of the world's knowledge. And then he went on to say, is it possible that God could exist in the 97% you don't know? And it's, we have to think about that. See, we were created for eternity, and so there is something inside of us that is reaching out for something that's beyond us. And it may not always be God. It may be, it may be a religion of some kind. It may be money. It may be science. It may be anything else, popularity. But, so there is the hard heart. So the solution is that God himself, the Holy Spirit, has to plow up our hearts, and we have to pray for people that they would become tender to spiritual things. Okay, we have the rocky soil. <clears throat> the rocky soil is that which uh, the, the seeds went into the ground and it received it greatly, <clears throat> and all of a sudden it sprouted up really quick because it didn't have any depth of soil. It just sprouted quick. But then the hot sun comes out, and I think we know something about the hot sun here. <laughs> I... Hey man, I tell you what, in fact, I've got a, I've, I've got a, I'm, I'm going to confess to you, I love planting plants, but I just, I just killed a squash and a tomato because, because of the heat here. They did not last. And I think I figured out what I did wrong. I, I put it inside our porch area on the cement, and you know those really brutal hot days before we got that... Man, they, they just cooked. And it, and it finally dawned on me that uh, the heat is coming up from the cement underneath and up on top, didn't have a chance, baked. Okay, so these, these plants, they fell in there really, and they quickly grew, but the sun came down and just beat them and they died. The sun killed them. So what does that represent? <clears throat> that represents the shallow heart. The person that they, they're after the next fad. And when they, they hear something, oh man, I want to chase after that. And then pretty soon some problems come, arise as a result of that, or maybe they start making, making you make commitments and then you go, mm, draw back a little bit. Nah, I don't think. So the next, next area, you just throw it in a ditch and go after the next fad. So what do you do about that? Well, that, because it's a shallow Shallow soil and rocky, rocky soil, you have to get the rocks out, just like the farmer has to get the rocks out of the soil. So there's a lot of distractions in our life that need to be taken out of, out of our lives. And I guarantee you, uh, you young guys, <laughs> you have so many distractions that we didn't have, we didn't have that many distractions. Um, here's a distraction, but this is an old distraction. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh, that's fine. But it is. Um, there's, you know, anybody here have ADD? Attention Deficit Disorder? Thank you. I th my son has that, and I think he might have gotten it from me. <clears throat> but I guarantee you there are a lot of people here who have spiritual ADD. Why do we have to spiritualize everything? But I think we do. Because we have, oh, oh do, 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 <laughs> squirrel, or whatever. And we get distracted so easily. So what has to happen? Oh, spiritual disciplines. I'll be talking about them in just a few minutes. And that sounds like so much fun, doesn't it? Disciplines. Oh. But it's so necessary in our life. Jesus never sugarcoated the gospel. He told it the way it was, and he said, this is what's got to be. Okay, we'll get to that later, though. But so, so that's what happens, that the world, it's the worldly person, worldly-minded person, the materialist, 
that tries to find meaning in all the, all the things of this life. So let's go on to the thorny or the weedy soil. It's a plant that grows great, but so do the weeds. And guess what? If you have a plant growing up and a weed growing up, who do you think is going to win? The weeds all the time. Always. I, I lived in Iowa. We had a little country church. We had a big old garden. Every time it was time to harvest our, our, our goods, <laughs> we had camp, which was about three, four hours away by horse and buggy. No, it wasn't that quite long. That wasn't that long ago. <laughs> Seems like it. But, it, but by, you know, by the time we were done for those two weeks, we came back, you couldn't see the corn. Even the corn was that high and the weeds were way up higher. Yeah, so that represents um, a divided heart. And it allows other things, circumstances of this life to come in and vie for its attention. What has to be done? The weeds have to be pulled out or sprayed or, or something has to be done in order to get them out so they don't take away from the nourishment of the rest of the plants. And God has to do that in our lives as well. Well, let's take a look at the productive soil, the fourth one, the good productive soil. It's rich, it's deep, it's weedless, and it's productive. It represents a heart that is sensitive and obedient to God and works for his eternal kingdom and brings forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. But you know, Ken and I were talking about this a little bit this morning on the way, and, and even, even with good soil, you still have to maintain it. You still have to build it up. So the person that has a good heart that wants to serve the Lord and wants to help other people, they, they still have to maintain that heart because it's so easy. We live in a broken world and we're human and it wouldn't take long for us to drift back. So we have to be aware of that. So let's talk about the discipline of preparation. Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Notice he didn't say we work for our salvation. We don't. That's a gift from God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. That is how we have forgiveness of sins and, and have eternal life. Yet there are things that we do that help us in our walk with him on this earth. And so these are some of the things that the power of the Holy Spirit cooperates with us in our spiritual disciplines. So now we're going to talk about some of those uh, spiritual disciplines. And I guarantee you, some of you probably could name some of them. I have 10 that I, I have down here. Um, let's see how much time we got. 10 minutes? That's okay. Well, all right. Well, the first one is the Word of God. Yeah, this, you know... We belong to Jesus. He belongs to us. We follow him. We have to be people of God's word. John Wesley said it this way. He said, I am the man of one book. He read other books. But what he meant by that was, upon this, I build my life. Billy Graham Billy Graham, yeah, what a guy. Fresh in many of our memories. But many years ago, before he began his crusades, he was challenged by some of his ministerial friends that didn't really think much about the Bible as well as they should have. And they told Billy, you're not going to really believe this and preach this, are you? And so he went out uh, at, in North Carolina on a star-studded night put the Bible down on a stump. And he prayed, and he, and he finally resolved, and he said, God, I'm going to believe your word and preach your word. Of course, what was funny was when he told his friends that, they said, Billy, you'll mount to nothing. Nobody will know you. And yet we don't remember those guys. God's word is so important. Uh, there are six things that we can do about God's word. First one is read it. That's important is to read that. <clears throat> listen to God's word. Not just hear what it says, but truly listen. Activate 
our whole, whole being and listening to God's word. Study his word. Anybody here like to study? I know Ken does. He, he said he loves to study. Then we memorize. <clears throat> Memorizing has probably been the most important for me because I grew up in a broken home and I, I, didn't, I didn't have any interest in school. I didn't. I didn't have any interest in reading, nothing. But then when, when Christ got a hold of my life, I started being hungry for God's word and I started reading and then I thought, boy, I want to memorize this. So I started memorizing portions of God's word. So in times, in times when I didn't have the Bible near at hand and I'd be going through a, a particular problem or whatever it might be, I would think of a scripture that would come to my mind and it was amazing the strength that it gave to me. So memorization is a very important thing. <clears throat> and then to apply it, allow the Holy Spirit to apply it in our lives. What is it saying and what does it mean to me? And finally, obey God's word. Those are important. Proverbs 30, verse 5. I love this verse. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Okay, so if... if um, if reading the Word of God, if the Word of God is the first spiritual discipline, what do you think is the second? Say it again. Prayer. prayer. To pray. That is very important. Uh, there's a Greek word for prayer, prosukomai, and it, it, it means two things. Okay. The first one is that it, it actually means an exchange. And then it's, it's an exchange of wills or desires. So when we go to God in prayer, it's a matter of, here's what I would like, God. Uh, what do you think? And then he gives his thought. And we exchange. It's really an alignment. Just like I work in the, uh, the automotive section. I don't work on the cars. You don't want me working on the cars. <laughs> But I work with the customers and I take phone calls, which my wife is like, you actually talk on the phone? Yes, I do. Remember what kind of phone I got. But anyway, um, so a lot of times they'll want an alignment. And I said, I'm sorry, we don't do alignments. But alignments are important. I know what alignment is. You align the wheels so they go down the road, right? You know, we need to align ourselves with God and his will. Did you know Jesus did that? The Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. The cup of knowing that he was going to die on a, a cursed death on the cross. He said, if possible, let this cup pass for me. Then the exchange. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Mark 11, 24 and 25. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe and you'll receive it. Prayer is important. The third one is the word faith. Faith is an act of the will. 1 John 5, 4 says, This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. To make up our minds that we are going to believe him and trust him. And there's a lot of words that are equated with faith. Belief, trust, obey, having confidence in, and having hope. The fourth one is wisdom. James 1.5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Nothing wavering but in faith. You know, all of us need a little bit of wisdom from time to time. <clears throat> Ken and I actually... Uh, Every Monday morning, we have Bible study together, which is a, a great blessing for both of us. And it's wonderful when you can share with somebody that, that you have in your life that is uh, a very trusted friend. When you need guidance, you need wisdom. You need his wisdom. And sometimes that's very important to have. And that's a spiritual discipline that's much needed. We definitely need wisdom today. Number five is fellowship and worship. Hey, that's what, we, that's what we did. Isn't that wonderful? I, I'll tell you what. Um, it, it's good for us to be out amongst people that don't know Jesus. It is good. Sometimes it's refreshing. 
but I can't think of anybody else I'd rather be with than my brothers and sisters in Jesus, especially when we worship the Lord together. There's something beautiful about that, and it strengthens us. It helps keep us accountable and humble as well. The sixth one is fasting. Um, I used to actually fast. Uh, I don't anymore, not food fast. But I found out there's other things you can fast. A few years ago, um, our youth minister at a church that I go to in, in Mesa, uh, at the Nazarene Church there, he had the youth do a media fast. That, oh, yeah, yeah. That's worse, that's worse than going without food, right? That means you had to give this up. Well, not this, but whatever you guys have. Show me what you got there. What, he, could you show me what you have there? I want to see what kind of phone he has. Or, okay, it looks like that, right? Okay, just imagine if you had to give that up for a week. Would it be hard on the youth? Or would it be hard on the adults? Yeah. yeah, okay, all right. So what does fasting do? We give up something that's maybe important to us, maybe vital to us, or maybe we have made vital to us. And by giving, setting it aside for a period of time, we're saying that, God, I, I want to go without this because it'll show that I need to depend on him. Then there's meditation. Number seven is meditation. There's something about solitude and silence and waiting on him that's valuable. Uh, when I was in seminary, back in the late 70s, early 80s, I was working full time and taking a full load at school. And I was just really... I needed a break. And so I had a day off from work and I also had a day off from school and my wife had to work so I jumped in my little beat up car and drove from Kansas City, Missouri to Pomme de Terre Lake. Anybody know where that is? Anybody here from Missouri? Nope. Okay. Anyway, it's a beautiful lake. <laughs> I drove up and I remember I drove up to the bank and, and I just kind of walked over the, the little hill and there was the lake right there with the trees around it. I just, and I love to fish. I love to fish. I didn't even have a fishing pole. I should have. <laughs> but I sat down and I meditated. I thought about God and his goodness. The silence. The solitude. It was beautiful that deepens our life with Christ as well. Then there's service. I might get in trouble with this one. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get in trouble. There, sometimes there's people that like to complain a lot and they get to be nosy, busy bodies. But you know how to take care of that? Get them active, working somewhere helping somebody that really needs help and, and maybe you want to be judicious in, in how and where you put them, but get them busy because then that will help them to focus more on others instead of themselves, which needs to be done. So service is one, one thing because it take, means that we take care of the needs of others and it reminds us of the many ways that God has taken care of us and done for us. Service. Number nine is sharing. <clears throat> evangelism that's sharing I love this definition I heard this long time ago and here's what evangelism is one beggar showing another beggar where the bread is isn't that good I love that because see we're, we're all beggars we all need him but if we have him then we can show another needy person where the bread of life is Jesus. Number 10, small groups, doing life together. Uh, that's, that's what we do every Monday night. Uh, tomorrow night, though, we hope to be in Kansas City. We're flying to Kansas to see our grandkids. Yay. <laughs> a whole week with a 9 and a 10-year-old and my wife, and my wife who has 
plenty of energy. I, as long as I know where a bed is at 8 o'clock, <laughs> I'll be okay. <laughs> but usually our, our, our group is still going to meet, even though we're not there. But in our, in our Monday night group, we get together. Ken has been a part of our group uh, at a, on a couple occasions. He doesn't come all the time, but uh, he has a group of his own that he's in. But the, the general thing that we do is we basically, we eat like a family together around a table and then we share what's on our minds and on our hearts we share from God's word and we pray together and I have seen people just blossom from that uh, there's one lady in our group that has epilepsy and she's had epilepsy since she was 12 years old and she's in her 70s now and there, there were a lot of times when she wanted to take her own life because her life was miserable. She became part of our group and then uh, found Jesus, became part of our church. And man, her life is so much different. She still has her physical problems, but she has Jesus with her. And, and we see that, and that's such a beautiful thing. But having a small group is really, wow, I, I mean, like, we have, well, anywhere from 14 to 20 people that come to our group, so I know that's a little bit more than, than the usual. Does that mean this time is up? <laughs> that's, uh, okay, I'm, I'm trying to find the landing place, you know, so. But anyway, uh, so, <clears throat> oh, thank you. So we have about 14 to 20 people in our group, but it's really a wonderful time because we get together and we share what's on our minds and, and sometimes we even break into smaller groups and just pray for one another, two or three people at a time. Uh, if you're not a part of a small group, uh, can I be one of those people that just say, hey, start a small group somewhere? Uh, and if you are part of a small group, great. <laughs> okay. Well, I said earlier that Jesus talked about the, the grain of wheat, that unless it falls to the ground and dies, it will not bear fruit. It has all that potential, but it won't do anything until it goes into the ground. You know what I find fascinating? Jesus' life paralleled that seed. He died. He was buried. New life very fruitful life. Billions of people today on the planet have the knowledge of Jesus Christ in some form or another. And all through history, there has always been a people of God, a remnant, all the way through to our own time, and will be until the day he comes back. So every, every spring, of course, here, <laughs> spring, we were singing that song, uh, summer and winter, springtime and harvest, and I go, that's all in one. I, I was thinking this, that's all one. <laughs> Here in Arizona, I, I used to live in, I'm from Minnesota originally. I've lived in Colorado, Kansas, and Iowa. They have seasons there. They do, okay. But every spring, it's a beautiful thing to see uh, something other than white for six months. And then all of a sudden, you see things growing. Why not a resurrection? Jesus said that very thing. He was the epitome of what he was just talking about. And the, the power of the seed, but it has to die. Jesus had to die. He had to be buried in order for his movement to go on for the kingdom of God, in order for our lives to be changed. And sometimes we have to die. We may have to die to our selfishness. We may have to die to our own agenda. We may have to die out to our own attitudes in order for Christ to fully live in us that we can share the life of Jesus with others. There's a lot, the power of a seed. But the soil, the preparation of the soil is so important. So I just want to ask you, as well as asking myself, and I, uh, whenever I preach, 
If it doesn't do anything for anybody else, it has to do something for me. But I have to ask my own, myself, as I inspect my own life, uh, am, I, am I willing to allow God to shape me according to his will by the disciplines of life, preparing my heart for him? So just leave you with that thought. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word and for uh, the truth. I pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, just allow it to sink into our hearts and, and grow and be productive. Uh, I love you, Jesus. I thank you for what you've done in my life. Help me to live a life pleasing to you. We give you the praise. And thank you for these wonderful people here. Pray a special blessing upon them as well. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching the sermon. Please stay tuned for a message from our Pastor Glenn. Thank you for joining us for today's message. And if you have any questions or would like to discuss this further, feel free to give us a call at 928-305-1132. Drop us an email at info at We hope to see you again next time. God bless.